Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, Pillars of the Faith is the second in our series. Last uh, time we did the essentials of the faith. Now this is the pillars of the faith. And the pillars of the faith are the uh, rational and uh, evidence ground on which Christianity rests. You, you may say, why examine the pillars of the faith? Why not just believe? Uh, Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And we add, and we had a little bumper sticker once, uh, the unexamined faith is not worth believing. There are a lot of unexamined faiths in the world. I talked uh, to a young Mormon one night, and he said, uh, as I was pointing out contradictions in Mormonism, he said, uh, if the Book of Mormon told me there were square circles, I would believe it. Well, of course, you can't do much for somebody uh, who has an irrational faith, and we don't have an irrational faith. Uh, the Bible doesn't say, leap before you look, or take a leap of faith in the dark. It says, take a step of faith in the light. And I liken it to two elevators. One elevator with the light on, and a man walking out of it. The other elevator with no light, and uh, you can't even see if there's a floor there, and nobody walking out of it. Uh, we're not asked to close our eyes and jump in the elevator with no light, because there might not be a floor there. We're asked to open our eyes, look at the evidence. A man just walked out, looks like there's a solid floor there, and take a step in. That's why we're examining the uh, pillars of our faith. In fact, uh, it's part of the great commandment. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. So it's actually a command to think through our faith. It's a command to think about what we believe. Philippians 4, Paul said, whatever things are true, think on these things. Apostle Peter said, set apart or sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. This is where we get our word apologetics, which means to give a defense from this very uh, verse. Give a defense for uh, the hope that is in you. Now, what are the pillars of the Christian faith? Well, there's the pillar of truth. Uh, we're going to have uh, very shortly in front of our building here a sign that's all complete, and it's going to say, I have a Bible on one side, and it'll say, Timeless Truths for. And it'll say, Welcome in the middle, and on the other side, it'll have a, a kind of clock, and it'll say, For Truthless Times. And that's what we have. We have timeless truth for truthless times. And so that's one of the pillars of the faith. We believe in truth, in absolute truth, in objective truth, and we're willing to defend it. Another pillar of our faith is God. Everything that we believe sooner or later goes back to God. We believe the Bible is the Word of God, but you can't have a Word of God unless you have a God who can have a Word. We believe Christ is the Son of God, but you can't have a Son of God unless there's a God who can have a Son. We believe in miracles called acts of God, but you can't have acts of God if you don't have a God who can act. So everything eventually goes back to this pillar. Uh, does God exist? And if he does, what kind of God exists? The third pillar of our faith is miracles. Most of the objection to Christianity that comes from the modern intellectual world comes from the fact that they have bought into an anti-supernatural point of view. From the time of David Hume, uh, who died incidentally the same year our country was born, 1776. From the time of David Hume to the present, uh, an anti-supernatural uh, spell has been cast on the intelligentsia of the Western world. Miracles simply are not credible. And if you pick up a book and it's filled with miracles, people walking on water, turning water into wine, multiplying loaves, resurrecting the dead, uh, I don't see that happening in the world today. Therefore, uh, miracles didn't happen pa in the past. And if you find a book that says they did, it can't be a credible book. We're going to examine that pillar. The fourth pillar of our faith is the Bible. Everything that we believe is based on the fact that this is a book from God, that this is the inspired Word of God. But is it trustworthy? Uh, is it accurate? Can we really trust that when it says Jesus said something, He really said it? 
Is the Bible the Word of God, or is it just the words of men about God, or the words of men about some supposed God that exists? And finally, the fifth and fundamental pillar of our faith is Jesus Christ. Is he really the Son of God? Could any human being, really, now, be God's Son? Isn't that incredible to say that somebody who was born of a woman could really be the creator of the universe? That's pretty hard to swallow for many people, and yet it's one of the pillars of our faith. Let's start with the first pillar, the pillar of truth. I want to answer several questions. What is truth? Is truth absolute? And can we know the truth? By the way, the answer to that by our generation is uh, that we don't know the nature of truth. It could be many things. Basically, it's what works for you to the pragmatist. It's what somebody intends to be true for the intentionalist. It's what grabs me for the existentialist. There are many different definitions of truth. What's true for me is not necessarily true for you. So the second question, is truth absolute? If it's true for me, is it true for everybody? If it's true for everybody uh, in every place at every time, then it would be an absolute truth. But are there really any absolute truths? I mean, uh, I feel warm, you may feel cold. Uh, there's no absolute truth. Everything is relative, we're told. And can opposites both be true? Seems rather strange that in our so-called rational generation that people would actually believe that opposites can both be true. You've seen the yin-yang symbol. Looks like a black and white uh, tadpole getting cozy, you know. Uh, there's a black dot in the white one and there's a white dot in the black one. Uh, you've heard of the Star Wars series, Luke Skywalker. Uh, when he cut off the head of Darth Vader, he had tapped into the light side of the force. Darth Vader, the dark side of the force, he cuts off Darth Vader's head and he looks in and he sees his face. Because I'm you, you're me, we're all God. Uh, there is no such thing as opposites uh, being uh, different. Everything is really one. Pilate asked the question, uh, he had a sneer, no doubt, in his uh, voice. Ironically, the truth was standing before him when he said, what is truth? But we want to answer the question now. We want to answer the question and show that there is truth, and you can define it, and we can know what it is. Truth is what matches its object. If I say to you, I have a brown Bible in my left hand, that statement is true because there's an object there, a brown Bible. So the statement about it is true because it corresponds with its object. Truth is what corresponds to the facts. Uh, if I say that it is a fact uh, that uh, George Washington was the first president of the United States, you can research it historically and find out whether or not that's true. And you'll find that there was a person named George Washington. He was the first president of the United States. So the statement is true. Or to put it in everyday language, truth is telling it like it is. Truth is telling it like it is. If you tell it like it is, you're telling the truth. And if you don't tell it like it is, you're not telling the truth. For example, uh, this object is a table. It's telling it like it is because that's a table. If it was a chair, the statement would be false. If it was a bed, the statement would be false. Anything but a table it would be false. Truth is telling it like it is. Now, somebody may say, well, I, I'd like to challenge your definition of truth. I don't think truth is telling it like it is. Truth is not telling it like it is. Then we say to him, isn't that telling it like it is? I mean, that statement that truth is not telling it like it is, he supposes that that's really telling it like it is. So he's really telling it like it is to tell you that truth is not telling it like it is. But if he's telling it like it is, then truth must be telling it like it is. Or here's one, you've heard this, there is no truth to which we respond. Is that true? I mean, how can you say there is no truth when you're claiming that's true? And if you're claiming that's true, then there is uh, truth. When you catch on to this, it's more fun than a Sunday school picnic because you can line them up and knock them down, uh, skeptics, agnostics, whoever comes along. You can't know the truth. That's an agnostic. He says you can't know the truth, to which we uh, add, how do you know that's true? 
I mean, he's claiming that that's true, that you can't know that anything is true. So he does know the truth or he wouldn't be able to make that statement. It's true for me, but not for you. It's not true for everybody. It's just true for me. Well, ask that person this. Is that true for you or is that true for everybody? He's making a statement that he thinks everybody should accept, that there is no statement that everybody should accept. I mean, if that statement is true for everybody, then he can't say that there is no statement that's true for everybody because he just gave you one that he thinks is true for everybody. There is no absolute truth. By this part, uh, uh, time, you've already caught on to it and you know what to say. Is that absolutely true? There is no absolute truth. Is that absolutely true? Now notice in just a few minutes what we did. We established one of the most fundamental pillars of our faith because we believe there's absolute truth and that you can know it. And we showed that anyone who denies that there is truth is affirming truth. Anyone who denies that there's absolute truth is affirming an absolute truth. Absolute truth is literally undeniable. We did what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we should do. We destroy arguments in every proud obstacle uh, that exalts itself uh, against the knowledge of God. The skeptic says, well, you should doubt everything. Don't come to any dogmatic conclusions. Uh, just be humble and doubt everything. Well, I just want to know one thing. Should I doubt that? You see, if you doubt doubt, where are you? You're back to knowing something for sure. Why shouldn't I be skeptical about skepticism? The skeptic wants me to be skeptical about everything except skepticism. The agnostic wants me to be agnostic about everything except agnosticism. Well, I choose to be agnostic about agnosticism, which means I can know something for sure. I choose to be skeptical about skepticism, which means I can know something for sure. The skeptic, the agnostic, the relativists are all absolutely unequivocally uh, uh, sure of their position. Opposites are both true, the yin and the yang, the light and the dark side of the force. Uh, if you go to a Zen Buddhist, take a lesson in Zen Buddhism, and you say to the Zen Buddhist master, what is the Tao, T-A-O? That's the ultimate, that's their surrogate for God. What is the Tao? The Zen Buddhist master will say, the, the Tao is one hand clapping. And you say, Master, one hand can't clap. It takes two hands to clap. And he'll say, now you begin to understand. And you say, begin to understand what? He th is trying to teach that there are no such thing as opposites. That's just lower level thinking, as Francis Schaeffer said. Down here on this level, there's true and false and right and wrong and good and evil. But on the highest level, there is no difference between good and evil, true or false. Just down, it's like one hand clapping. Now, what do we say to somebody who says opposites are both true? You say, is the opposite of that true? Oh, no, the opposite of that's not true. Well, you just told me that uh, opposites are both true. But you're not admitting that the opposite of that statement is true. Uh, you're saying the opposite of that statement is false. But that's exactly what I told you. The opposite of true is false. So even the person who says opposites are both true does not believe that the opposite of his statement is true. Therefore, he doesn't really believe what he says. Uh, it is uh, a false position. Opposite of true is false. There was a famous Muslim philosopher who got his point across very well to anyone who denied this law of non-contradiction that opposites cannot both be true at the same time in the same sense. He said, if anyone denies this, then just beat him and burn him until he admits that to be beaten is not the same as not to be beaten, and to be burned is not the same as not to be burned. Pretty uh, good and quick way to convince a skeptic that opposites are not uh, both true at the same time in the same sense. So the pillar of truth, what have we discovered? There is truth, 
You can know it, and it's absolutely true. If it's true for somebody, it's true for everybody, and opposites can't both be true. Truth corresponds with the facts. Truth is true for everyone. We can know the truth, and opposites can't both be true. This is undeniable. You try to deny any one of those statements, and you have to affirm the statement. Therefore, we have a solid foundation for our belief in absolute truth. <coughs> the pillar of truth, the pillar of God. Does God exist? And if so, what kind of God exists? This is a fundamental question. Can we know the truth? Yes, we can know truth. Well, now, is it true that God exists? And if a God does exist, what kind of God exists? Because there are many different kinds of gods. There's polytheism and finite godism and deism and theism, many different kinds of gods. Well, basically, there are three views of God. Theism, pantheism, and atheism. Theism says God made all, the hand holding up the world. He created the world. Pantheism says God is all, the hand is the world. And atheism says there is no God at all. There's a world, but no God. Carl Sagan said uh, the cosmos is everything that ever was, is, and will be. Those three views, by the way, were all found in Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17 when Paul was preaching. Paul was a theist, monotheist, and he was talking to Epicureans and Stoics. The Epicureans were atheists and the Stoics were pantheists. What's the difference between an atheist and a pantheist? An atheist says all is matter. A pantheist says all is mind. The medieval teacher said to his class, what is matter? One student said, never mind. He said, what is mind? He said, no matter. Uh, that's it. That's the difference between atheists and a pantheist. Uh, one says all is mind. One says all is matter. What does a theist say? Mind made matter. Even uh, Karl Marx, the famous father of modern Marxism, said there are two basic views. Either matter produce mind or mind produce matter. Now, it makes no sense that the lower can produce the higher because a, an, a cause or an effect cannot rise higher than its cause. So it makes more sense to say mind produce matter. But which of these views is true and how do we know? I'd like to give you three reasons why I believe theism is true. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, Isaiah 118. One reason is the universe had a beginning. And everything that has a beginning has a beginner. Second reason is life is in, uh, shows incredible design. But incredible design takes an incredible designer. Three, there is an objective moral law. But you can't have an objective moral law without a moral law giver. By the way, all three of those reasons are alluded to in the Bible. The universe had a beginning. Romans 1, 19 and 20, creation reveals that there is a creator. Life is incre uh, incredible design, that there's design in the universe. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. In Psalm 19, 1. There is an objective moral law, Romans 2, 12 to 15. There's a law written in their hearts, and there must be a law giver. Let's take these one by one. The first reason. Everything that had a beginning had a cause. The universe had a beginning, therefore the universe had a cause. Now the first statement everybody knows intuitively is true. Can't come to be without a cause. Nothing happens willy-nilly. That's the fundamental law of science. Francis Bacon, the father of modern science in 1620, when he wrote the book that gave rise to modern science, Novum Organum, said, this is what science is all about, a search for causes. David Hume, the famous skeptic, said, I never asserted such an absurd thing as that things can arise without a cause. They just don't happen. If they come to be, something must have caused it to come to be. Julie Andrews sang it, you remember, in The Sound of Music. Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. Take something to make something. Well, if the first premise is true, is rational, what about the second one? The universe had a beginning. If the second premise is true, 
Friend, there must be a God. There must be a creator beyond the universe who made the universe. And there's more evidence for that second premise uh, than for most things uh, in science and in the modern world. Let me give you just two reasons that the universe must have had a beginning. It's running down. We're running out of usable energy. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. Second reason, there cannot be an endless series of moments before today. Let's take the first one. The universe is running down. Whatever is running down is not eternal. The universe is running down, therefore the universe is not eternal. It must have had a beginning, because you can't be running down forever. Uh, take, for example, an hourglass. If all the sand is not in the bottom, what do you know for sure? That's not been going on forever. Uh, because if it was going, uh, had been going on forever, all that sand would have been in the bottom a long time ago. The universe is running down. It's running out of usable energy. Let's take your car as an example. You stop in the gas station and you fuel up. Uh, what happens? It runs down. And you have to go back and fuel up. You say, well, but that energy is going somewhere. Well, if you stood by the tailpipe and by the car and you caught all of the energy coming off that car and you could convert it back into gas, it would be less gas than you started with. You'd still be running down. Because in the process, something is used up. It's turned into unusable heat energy. Second law of thermodynamics. Now, this law is one of the most universally established laws in all of science because in a closed, isolated system, such as the whole universe is, the amount of usable energy is decreasing. In a closed, isolated system, the amount of usable energy is decreasing. Therefore, the universe is running out of usable energy. Here's an agnostic astronomer who admitted this. He says, once hydrogen has been burned within that star and converted to heavier elements, it can never be restored to its original state. Minute by minute and year by year, as hydrogen is used up in the stars, the supply of this element in the universe grows smaller. In his book, God and the Astronomers, the universe is running out of usable energy. It had a beginning. But whatever has a beginning had a beginner. He said, the scientist's pursuit of the past ends in the moment of creation. This is an exceedingly strange development unexpected by all but theologians. They have always accepted the word of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, when an agnostic astronomer is saying Genesis 1-1 is the answer to this question, why is energy running down, then I think uh, we have sound basis for believing that there must have been a creator of the universe. Second reason, there cannot be an endless series of moments before today. An endless series has no end. That's self-evident. But today is the end of the series of all days before today. That's obvious. Today is the last day in all the chain of days before today. But you can't have the end of an endless series. Therefore, the series of days before today is not infinite, is not endless, must have had a beginning. This particular argument was used by the Muslim philosophers, picked up by the Christian Bonaventura in the uh, late Middle Ages and was revived by William Lane Craig in our time. It's called the Kalam from the Arabic word for eternal. You can't have an eternal number of moments before today. You say, well, I took a math class, and I know that you can have an infinite number of points between these two fingers. Yeah, but that's because points are abstract. They don't have any dimension. We're talking about concrete things. You can't have an infinite number of links in a chain. You can't have an infinite number of sheets of paper between these two fingers. You can't get any concrete infinite between them. Abstractly can be an infinite. We're talking about real time, the real world. There can't be an infinite chain. Now, if an endless series has no end, and today is the end of all moments before today, then time had a beginning. It must have been created, which is precisely 
uh, what Albert Einstein had to conclude to his own embarrassment. The second reason, every design has a designer. The universe and life manifest design. Therefore, the universe and life have a designer. This is one of the simplest and most uh, potent arguments for the existence of God. Every design has a designer. The universe has design. Therefore, it's design. As William Paley said, if you found a watch, let alone a Rolex watch, uh, if you're walking across the field and picked up a watch, you'd know immediately there was a watchmaker. Why? Because of its design. Because of the way all the parts are put together. Because it has a function um, telling the time. Now, the universe is far more complex than a watch. In fact, it doesn't even compare. A, a watch doesn't even compare uh, to the universe. If a watch takes a designer, how much more does the universe take a designer? Let me illustrate it this way. Suppose you go in a local astronomy uh, room in your high school or college and you see a model uh, of the solar system. Everything is going in order. It's just beautifully uh, done. And uh, the teacher is telling you how much time it took them to put this together and how much effort it took. And then when he's all through, you say to him, you know, I think that happened uh, by the wind blowing through the alley. And it picked up some of the garbage there and it just formed all this one day. And he feels insulted because it took his intelligence and all of his effort to put it together. And he says, you, know, you can't possibly believe that. But that's exactly what they believe if they don't believe in God. They have to believe that it all happened by chance with no intelligent being. They put not just a model of the solar system, but put the whole universe into operation. One of the brightest men who ever lived, obviously he stuck his finger in a socket, um, Albert Einstein, said this, the harmony of natural law reveals an intelligence of such superiority that compared with it all the systematic thinking and acting of human beings is an utterly insignificant reflection. When you think of the harmony of natural law and you think of the mathematical nature of the universe, it must have taken a super mathematician to figure this out. No one in their right mind should deny this. Let's suppose your favorite cereal is alphabets. And suppose you wake up tomorrow morning and they're spilled over and it says, take out the garbage, mom. How many scientists would believe the cat knocked it over? How many atheists would believe that there was an earthquake that shook the house and did that? Is there anybody really in their right mind who would believe any natural force, the wind blowing in the window, somebody shaking the table, somebody is throwing the box up in the air and letting it fall down? Doesn't it, just a simple little message like that, take out the garbage mom, doesn't it take an intelligent being, even if it wasn't mom, even if it was your sister fooling you, still took a, an intelligent being to do it, right? Intelligent design from an intelligent being. You're lying on the beach. You look up and you see drink Coke or whatever your favorite is. Every intelligent being knows that there must have been some intelligent being behind this. No one would say, well, that's unusual. The, the wind is coming from the east today, you know. Uh, unusual cloud formation. Everybody knows how it got there. Even if you didn't see the plane do it or someone do it, you know it took an intelligent being to do it. If you're walking down the beach and you see, John loves Mary, written in the sand. Anybody believe a turtle does that? Or a fish just kind of wiggled up there? And did that, and nobody believes that. Why? Because we all know it takes an intelligent being to make a simple little message. Now, how about this message? We are told that there is a genetic alphabet, a four-letter alphabet in every living thing, and that a single-cell animal, like an amoeba, protozoa, a single-cell animal, has this complex genetic code in it that is so complex that if you spelled it out in English, a one-cell animal would equal 1,000 volumes of an encyclopedia. No one in their right mind would believe that 1,000 volumes of the encyclopedia resulted from an explosion in a printing shop. You know, all the print is there and everything, paper is there. 
But it doesn't happen that way. Why? It takes an intelligent being to write, John loves Mary. Drink Coke. Take out the garbage mom. How about a thousand volumes of an encyclopedia? It takes a super intelligent being. Charles Darwin, no pun intended, uh, said, when I look at the human eye, I shudder. Well, why did he shudder? He shuddered because he couldn't explain that by evolution. Evolution says it evolved gradually, part by part, over a long period of time, from a photosensitive cell uh, to an eye. If you have 90% of the eye, how much sight do you have? Zero. You have to have every part there. You have to have the lens. You have to have the optic nerve. You have to have the retina. A highly complex thing can't possibly evolve time uh, a little over a long period of time because you wouldn't be able to see for all those millions of years. And what do you say? Survival of the fittest. Well, the fit aren't the blind running around, so it wouldn't have worked. Darwin's Black Box is a revolutionary book that was written by Michael Be uh, Behe, and Michael Behe said this, the conclusion of intelligent design flows naturally from the data itself, not from sacred books or sectarian beliefs. Life on Earth at its most fundamental level, its most critical components, is the product of intelligent activity. And this has been a block-busting book, and it's given birth to a whole new movement, the intelligent design movement in modern science. Who designed the human brain? Do you know how much information there is in a human brain? If you went to a major NBA stadium, say 20,000 seats, and you put a thousand books on every chair, that would take it right out the ceiling. A thousand books on every chair. That's how much information is in the human brain. 20 million volumes. That's a library of Congress. They're inside between every pair of ears. Listening to me, uh, there's 20 million volumes of genetic information. Who designed it? Takes an intelligent being. Carl Sagan and the SETI program, there was a movie called Contact. And they were listening for a message from outer space. You remember they got that sequence of prime numbers and they were so excited uh, that they had gotten it. One message from outer space would prove there are intelligent beings out there. Well, how about 20 million volumes from outer space? between your two ears. Well, that happened by chance. Not a chance. Super intelligence, 20 million volumes, must have created. Summary of the second reason. Every design has a designer. The universe and life manifest design. Therefore, the universe and life have a designer. Everything begins as a beginner. Everything is designed as a designer. Third reason for God. Every moral law has a moral law giver. There is an absolute moral law, therefore there is an absolute moral law giver. Now the first premise is obviously true. Why? Because every prescription has a prescriber. If you go to uh, the uh, pharmacist uh, and you say, would you fill my prescription? And he says, who prescribed it? You say, nobody. It's just a prescription. Well, if it's a prescription, somebody prescribed it, right? If it's a legislation, there must have been a legislator. If it's a moral law, there must have been a moral law giver. So the first premise is self-evidently true. What about the second one? There is an absolute moral law. We live in a day when people don't believe in absolutes. Can we prove there is at least one moral absolute? If there is, not two, not three, at least one, absolute moral law, there must be an absolute moral law giver. Let me give you a few reasons. There is an absolute moral law, otherwise we would not know some things are unjust. I love to debate atheists, especially Jewish atheists. Over the years that I did this actively, debating atheists about 25 years, my favorite atheists were Jewish atheists because I would always chide them. I'd say, now the Holocaust, do you think that was really wrong? Oh yes, that's really wrong. I mean, is that absolutely wrong to commit genocide on Jews? Oh, yes, that's absolutely wrong. Okay, so you got one absolute moral law. Now tell me, how can you have an absolute moral law without an absolute moral law giver? See, they're not going to retreat and say, well, the not that's just the way the Nazis felt. It's all relative. Nazis hate Jews. Uh, no, they're not going to say that. Right, because it's their neck. 
We would not know some things are unjust, but we do. In fact, the atheist's best argument against God is this. How can there be a good God if there's all this evil in the world? Oh, you believe there's injustice in the world? Tell me. How do you know there's injustice in the world if you don't know some standard of justice beyond the world by which you measure that? Oops, they went too far. We would not know some things are better, but we do. This whole idea that beauty is relative uh, is absolutely false. Everybody knows that a sunset and a rainbow is more beautiful than a bunch of maggots in a garbage pail. Everybody knows that intuitively. And everybody knows intuitively that Mother Teresa is better than Hitler. And that a mother cuddling and nursing her baby is more loving than somebody who is crashing its head on a rock and beating its brains out. Everybody knows that intuitively. Relativists would not be able to say we should never say never. If there were no absolutes, you couldn't even be a relativist because they say you should never say never. Let's put it this way, get our cartoon professor to work here. This world is absolutely unjust. How can he know what is absolutely unjust without knowing what's absolutely just? Duh. If the world is absolutely unjust, you must have an absolute standard of justice by which you know that. C.S. Lewis put it this way. As an atheist, my argument against God was the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. There's a straight line and there's a crooked line. You wouldn't know the line was crooked unless you knew what was straight. And you don't know there's anything wrong in this world. Ravi Zacharias had a beautiful way in his Harvard uh, Veritas form of answering the relative. Some lady got up to the microphone and was going on about everything is relative and there are no absolutes. And Ravi very calmly said to her, ma'am, just let me ask you one question to get at the heart of this. Is there anything wrong anywhere? Is there anything wrong anywhere? Now, of course, even the most ardent liberal believes that there's injustice, intolerance, bigotry, there's all kinds of things wrong everywhere. If there's anything wrong anywhere, there must be a guy. Because you're saying something is really wrong. You have to know something is really right in order to know that. Absolute moral law implies an absolute moral law giver. Mother Teresa is better than Hitler. We can't make moral comparisons without an objective moral standard, but we do. Which one would you hire to babysit your children? Now, if you find a relativist and they say, well, I don't think there's any difference between Mother Teresa and Hitler, well, which one would you hire to babysit your kids? I don't think, if, especially if I was Jewish, I don't think I would hire Hitler. Lewis again. The moment you say that one set of moral ideas can be better than another, you are in fact measuring them both by a standard saying that one of them conforms to that standard more nearly than the other, but the standard that measures two things is something different from either. Must be an objective moral law. Self-defeating nature of relativism. Joseph Fletcher, a number of years ago, wrote a book called Situation Ethics, in which he said, avoid words such as no, never, and always like the plague. Now translate that in English. You should never say never. Well, you just did. You should always avoid using the word always. Well, you just didn't avoid it yourself. You should absolutely avoid the word absolute. They can't do it. I had a uh, student who went on to get his PhD in philosophy at Purdue University. <laughs> he was teaching a course in ethics and he had an atheist in his class, total relativist. And they were told they could write a term paper on any topic, so he wrote on total relativism. <laughs> it was a brilliant paper, well documented, well footnoted, well argued. He handed it in, the professor read it, and he wrote on it, F, I don't like blue folders. Sent it back to the student. The student got his brilliant paper, and it said, F, 
because it's a blue folder. He stormed into professor's office and said, that's not fair. That is not just. That is not right. And the professor said, what do you mean? Fair, just, right. Those are moral principles. You said you didn't believe in it. Isn't this a paper you said everything is like, you like blue, I like red, you uh, like chocolate, I like vanilla, it's all relative. Isn't that the, yeah, that's what I believe. That's what my beliefs. Well, if it's all a matter of taste, I don't like blue. F handed him his paper back. <laughs> Suddenly the young man realized that he did believe in moral absolutes. He believed it was absolutely wrong to give somebody an F just because the folder was blue. Absolutely wrong. If there's one moral absolute, there must be a, an absolute moral law giver. Every moral law has a moral law giver. There is an absolute moral law. Therefore, there is an absolute moral law giver. Now, what did we conclude? What kind of God exists? A theistic God of the three choices there, theism, atheism, pantheism. Why? Because he's super powerful, reason number one. He made the universe out of nothing. He's super intelligent. He designed the incredible universe. He's morally perfect. He's as different from the world as a cause is from its effect, as an author is from his book, and as a lawgiver is from his law. That's a theistic God, pantheistic God. God is the world. This God is beyond the world like an author is beyond his book. And a moral lawgiver, a legislator, is beyond the legislation. We have given three good, powerful reasons to believe that pantheism and atheism were both wrong. Now, notice what that does. That means Hinduism, Buddhism, New Age, secular humanism, Mormonism, polytheism, Wicca, Confucianism, and Taoism are all false. Why? Because they're not theistic religions. They don't believe in a theistic God. Their fundamental belief is wrong. Once you show good reasons for believing in theism, you have eliminated the major two competitors to Christianity in the world today. That leaves Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the three great monotheistic religions. How do we know which one of those is true? Well, miracles. Which one was confirmed by miracles? Because the God of the universe would never allow, allow somebody to speak in his name a prediction, uh, and a prediction come to pass, and it was false. So he can't be uh, confirming the false to be true by miracles. Miracles would only confirm the true God. Are miracles possible? Are miracles actual? And what's the purpose of miracles? C.S. Lewis said it beautifully. C.S. Lewis said, But if we admit God, must we admit miracles? Indeed, indeed, you have no security against it. That's the bargain. Once you say there's a God who can act, you've admitted that there can be acts of God. A miracle is an act of God. If there's a God who can act, you've admitted that miracles are possible. If God exists, miracles are actual. Because the biggest miracle has already occurred. What's the biggest miracle? Making something out of nothing. It's pretty easy to take something and make something. Jesus took water and made wine. No problem. It rains, goes into the vine, up through the vine into the grape, and the grape turns into wine. All Jesus did was speed it up. No problem making water into wine. It happens all the time, right? The problem is making water out of nothing. Did you ever take a handful of nothing, absolutely nothing, and make some water? Oh, you can take hydrogen and oxygen and make it, H2O, but... You can't take nothing and make it. If God created this universe, the biggest miracle is not possible. It's actual. It happened. If the biggest miracle happened, then smaller ones can occur. If God can create life, then he can resurrect the dead. Here's a book that says Jesus resurrected the dead. You say, well, I, that's incredible. Not if God existed, isn't. If the first verse of the Bible is true, every other verse is believable. I didn't say true. It's believable. Because that's the biggest miracle. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Resurrecting the dead, no problem if you can create life. B, 
if he can make something from nothing, then he can make something from something, like wine from water, or uh, many loaves from a few loaves. Did you ever think of it? Every time you plant wheat, you're planting bread. What do you get? More bread. Happens all the time. You plant bread, you get more bread. Plant wheat, you get more wheat. Plant rye, you get more rye. Happens all the time. God just speeded up the process and the miracles there. Here's our agnostic friend, Robert Jastrow. That there are what I or anyone would call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, a scientifically proven fact. Scientifically proven. That's pretty good for an, an agnostic. It's a scientifically proven fact that supernatural forces produce this universe. If they did, then miracles are not only possible, they're actual, and others can happen. What about David Hume? David Hume is supposed to have disproven miracles. <coughs> He's supposed to have, in this argument, forever put to silence anyone who believes that it's credible to believe in miracles. Listen to his argument. Natural law is, by definition, a description of a regular occurrence. You stick somebody's head under the water for five minutes, he drowns. You take somebody else five minutes, he drowns. After three or four people, if you're still out of jail, uh, you figure, this is a natural law here. Suffocation. Secondly, a miracle is by definition a rare occurrence. How many virgin births have you observed? Every once in a while, a guy tells that to the judge, and he goes to jail anyway. Doesn't happen. Uh, miracles are by definition rare occurrences. Three, the evidence for the regular is always greater than the evidence for the rare. We see it all the time on sports programs. The referee sees it from one angle in real time, and you see it from all kinds of angles, slow motion. Who's in a better position to know? The regular is greater than the rare. A wise person always bases his belief in the greater evidence. I fly out of Charlotte Airport a lot, and when I go there, believe me, if smoke is coming out the tail, one wing is broken off, and the, and the pilot is jumping out the cockpit, I don't get on. I don't get on. The evidence is not very good that it'll get you anywhere. Therefore, a wise person should never believe in miracles. This is the most powerful argument against miracles ever devised by a human mind. So powerful is it that it's lasted for uh, uh, almost 300 years. Almost 300 years. And it's still used by skeptics today to prove that you should not believe in a book with miracles in it. Now, if, the, if that conclusion uh, is true, then we're out of business. And if that conclusion is false, there's got to be something wrong with one of those premises. So let's take a look at the premises again. Natural law is, by definition, a regular occurrence. That looks good to me. It has to happen over and over to be a natural law. Miracles are rare. That looks good to me. If it's happening over and over, it's not a miracle. It's a natural law. That looks bad to me. The evidence for the regular is always greater than the evidence for the rare. I don't think so, and I'll show you why. Therefore, it doesn't follow that if a wise person bases his belief on the greater evidence, he shouldn't believe in miracles. Why? Because from David Hume's own worldview, a naturalistic worldview, they believe in things that happen only once for which they think there's greater evidence. So we're challenging the evidence for the regular is not always greater than the evidence for rare. For example, the origin of the universe has never been repeated. This is what scientists call the Big Bang, way back there. Fifteen billion years ago, there was a bang and the universe exploded into being. You say, hmm, the Big Bang, how many times did that happen? Once. Has it ever banged again? No, it's never banged again. It's not the big bang, 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 bang theory. It's just a big bang theory. <coughs> well, how many times did it bang before that? <coughs> there was no universe to bang. There was nothing. So it couldn't have banged before. It hasn't banged since, and yet they believe it happened. Most scientists believe, most astrophysicists, in the big 
Bang Theory. The origin of the universe has never been repeated. Secondly, how many times has life come from non-life? If you tell your biology teacher, I sterilized the beaker, I sterilized the cap, I put it on it, I came back tomorrow and there was life overnight, just spontaneously. She will not believe you. Why? Ready and pasture disprove spontaneous generation. And yet, these people believe that at the beginning, life came from non-life spontaneously. You say, well, how many times has that happened since? Oh, it doesn't happen since. Is it happening in sardine jars, you know, or cans? No, how about under the bed? You know, from dust we came to dust we shall return. I see a lot of dust under the bed. Is that happening? No, it's not happening there. So they believe it happened once and has never been repeated so far as we can observe, and yet the evidence is greater for something that happened only once. They also believe in macroevolution. Macroevolution is from uh, the goo to you via the zoo. You know, the whole thing. It's from the infantile through the reptile to the crocodile to the gentile. The whole thing. We evolved uh, from atom to Adam. How many times has that been repeated? Hadn't been repeated. Oh, it just happened once. Yeah. And you believe it. Yeah. Well, Hume said you can't do that. If it doesn't happen over and over, you can't uh, believe it. You see, by their own rules, by their own beliefs, Hume's argument is wrong. How many times does it have to happen to be true? How many times do you have to get a perfect uh, uh, pinnacle hand or bridge if you're a Christian? How many times do you have to get a perfect hand? for it to be true. I mean, if you're dealt the perfect hand, you're dealt the perfect hand. Uh, it doesn't matter what the odds are, it's still a perfect hand. It could happen only once. How many times, it's like hitting a hole in one and your buddies say, I don't believe that. If you could tee that up and do it seven more times, seven more times in a row, I'll believe that you got a hole in one. If you have four sober, honest, sane people who witnessed it, you don't have to do it over and over. Just once will do. Are miracles possible? You bet. If God exists, miracles are possible. Are they actual? You bet. He did the big one at the beginning, and he can do smaller ones since. Well, why does he do miracles? He tells us. Nicodemus said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do except God is with them. Acts 2.22, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself know. The message was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. What is a miracle? It's an act of God to confirm the word of God through a prophet of God. God exists, we have good reason. If he's going to give a message to us, how, he's, how is he going to confirm it? Any Tom, Dick, and Harry can come along and say, I had a trip to heaven. God spoke to me. But not every Tom, Dick, and Harry can raise the dead, walk on water, turn water to wine. Miracles are an act of God to confirm the word of God through a prophet of God. The pillar of truth, pillar of God, the pillar of miracles, the pillar of the Bible. Is the New Testament historically reliable? Can I pick up a red letter edition of the New Testament, reading the words of Jesus, and know that he really said those things? Answer, it's the most reliable book from the ancient world. The most reliable book. There are more manuscripts, latest count we just got this week, 5,750 to be exact, New Testament manuscripts right from the university in Germany that counts them. There are earlier manuscripts within 150 years of the time the New Testament was written. We have gospels and epistles. There are better copied manuscripts, copied with up to 99.9, uh, 99.5 percent accuracy. There are more contemporary writers. We had nine New Testament writers who wrote 27 books with more historical confirmation 
than for any book from the ancient world. Why are people doubting the Bible? If you doubt the Bible, you've got to throw out all of ancient history. Every history book in every high school, every college, every university in the world, every classics book. In fact, you can't even believe in macroevolution. Why? You weren't there. It's not been repeated. All we have is a tiny little fragment of all the fossils that ever existed. We have a tiny little fragment. How can you reconstruct that whole thing? They do. So can we. There are more manuscripts, earlier manuscripts, better copied manuscripts, more, more contemporary writers, more contemporary writings, and more historical confirmation than any book from the ancient world. Look at that chart. The New Testament in the orange. The other, uh, the gap uh, in the lavender color. We have more manuscripts, the most manuscripts for any book outside of the Bible is Homer's Iliad, 643. And then Demosthenes, he's got to put a pebble on his tongue and practice speaking to the waves. Herodotus 8, Plato 7, Tacitus 20, Caesar 10, Pliny 7, sometimes when you have 10 or 20, and they never doubt that that's what Plato said. And we got now uh, the updated figure, 5,750. Archaeology. U.S. News and World Report is not the fundamentalist journal. Uh, it's not known for being a conservative magazine, but here's what it says. In extraordinary ways, modern archaeology has affirmed the historical core of the Old and New Testaments, corroborating key portions of the stories of Israel's patriarchs, the Exodus, the Davidic monarchy, and the life and times of Jesus. Guess what? That's the whole Bible. That's the whole Bible right there. Archaeology has confirmed. Here's a house of David, a rock that was found 1993 with David's name inscribed on it. Here's Jesus' hometown synagogue in Nazareth on earth. Here's Pontius Pilate who tried Jesus, 1961. There's the inscription with his name on it. There's uh, Joseph Caiaphas, the high priest who tried Jesus, his name inscribed on it. There's a crucifixion victim from the first century, crucified just like they said Jesus was crucified. Uh, some believe that this is uh, James, the son of Joseph, the brother of Jesus, that that is ossuary. Some uh, doubt it, but we do know this. Uh, there are uh, ossuaries found uh, with those names on it that are the same kind of names that they had in the first century. Here's a tomb just like Jesus' tomb was, where the ridge on the bottom where they rolled the stone uh, in. There are all kinds. There are literally 25,000 archaeological finds that support the biblical world picture. Is there truth? Yes. Is there a God? Yes. Are miracles possible? Yes. Is the New Testament historically reliable? Yes, yes, yes. More than any other book from the ancient world. How do people know Alexander the Great lived and did what he did? Two biographers who lived over 300 years after his time. We have 27 books written by nine people during the first century that overlap with the time of Jesus. The pillar of Christ. Christ's claims and Christ's credential. He claimed to be and he proved to be the Son of God. In these historically reliable documents, he affirmed his deity by saying, I'm the great I am of Exodus 3.14. That he was Yahweh. Well, Yahweh is the light, I am the light. Yahweh was the first and the last, I am the first and the last. He was the good shepherd, I am the good shepherd. He claimed to be equal with God, and they picked up stones to stone him, saying, you being a man, make yourself God. He claimed to be the Messiah God. The high priest said, I adjure you, under oath, tell us, are you the Messiah? And he said, I am. And you'll see me coming in power and great glory. And the high priest ripped his garments, saying he blasphemed. On nine occasions, Jesus calmly accepted worship. On two occasions, he commended the people for doing it, never condemned anyone for doing it. He claimed to have all authority in heaven and earth, same authority as God. 
He claimed to be the object of prayer. Pray in my name and the Father will hear you. C.S. Lewis put it beautifully. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish things that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd rather be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. We've got historically reliable documents. He claimed to be God. And historically reliable documents show he proved to be God. You say, well, wait a minute. He said, the Father is greater than I. Answer, the Father is greater in office. My Father has a higher office than me. I have the office of Son. He has the office of Father. We both have human natures. We're both equal in nature. As God, the Father is greater than he was as man, but he is the God-man. Well, he didn't even know the time of his second coming. Jesus didn't. As God, he didn't, but as man, uh, as God, he did, but as man, he did not know. He has two natures. Well, God can't be three and yet one. Yes, he can. A triangle is. One to the third power is. Love is. Lover, loved one, spirit of love. Thought is. I have a mind. I have thoughts. I have words. They're one, and yet they're three. Who said you can't be three in one? There's three in one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three corners of the triangle. There's three in one. Three who's and one what? There's the Father who, the Son who, and the Holy Spirit who. And you got one what? One triangle, three corners. And Jesus has one who and two what's. What one is divine nature. What two is human nature. This is my Abbott and Costello theology. <laughs> One God, three persons. One triangle, three corners. Three ways that Jesus proved to be God. By fulfilling supernatural predictions, by performing supernatural acts, and by his supernatural resurrection. No other religious leader ever did this. You say, how do you know? Because we have historically reliable documents in which he claimed to be God and proved to be God by a miracle. What is a miracle? An act of God to confirm the word of God through a prophet of God. Look at just a few of these predictions. He would come from the human race. He would come from the ethnic group of Abraham, the tribe of Judah, the dynasty of David. He would be born of a virgin in the city of Bethlehem. Now stop right there. How many people in the history of the world fulfilled all those? Just one. And how many of them died 33 A.D., according to Daniel 9? 483 years after 44, uh, 444 B.C. So only one person in the entire uh, world who ever did that. Jesus proved to be God by, perform, by performing supernatural acts. Jesus told the scribes that he was doing this miracle to prove he was the Son of God in Mark chapter 2. Nicodemus said, you must be from God or you couldn't do these miracles. Early history, in Acts says, he was confirmed as the Son of God by miracles. Evidence that Jesus died. Crucifixion kills you. It literally kills you. You die from asphyxiation because you can't pull yourself up anymore to breathe. And if you haven't breathed in about three minutes, you're dead. If you haven't screamed because to pull yourself up, the nails pull, uh, you have to you, you scream, excruciating pain. His mother, friends, and closest disciples saw him die. The Roman soldiers who were professional executioners pronounced him dead. The spear, put in his side, assured his death. The Roman authority, Pilate, confirmed his death. The Jewish and secular historians recorded his death, Josephus, Tacitus, Thallus, Lucian, Phlegon, and the Jewish Talmud. Modern medical authorities confirmed that Jesus was dead. In the Journal of American Medical Association, March 21st, uh, 1986, it says this. Clearly, the weight of historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted and supports the traditional view that the spear thrust between his right rib probably perforated not only the right lung, but also the pericardium, 
and uh, heart and thereby ensured his death. Accordingly, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Not only did he die, but he rose from the dead. He left an empty tomb, an empty grave closed behind. He was seen 12 times by a total of 500 witnesses. They touched his physical body on two times. Two times were asked to touch it. They saw his crucifixion scars twice. They ate with him four times. He ate physical food. He taught them for 40 days. He did miracles for them during this time period. He transformed them from scared, scattered, skeptical disciples to the world's greatest missionary society overnight. If Jesus fulfilled prophecy, performed miracles, died and rose from the dead, then we can answer the last question. Is the Bible the word of God? The Son of God said it was, and he was confirmed by acts of God. And when Jesus said the Bible is divinely authoritative, it is written, it is written, it is written. He said it's imperishable, heaven and earth will pass away. It'll never pass away. He said it's infallible, the scriptures cannot be broken. He said it's without error, you do err not knowing the scriptures. He said to the Sadducees, it's historically reliable. When it talks about Noah, when it talks about Jonah, scientifically accurate. When it talks about Adam and Eve, God made Adam and Eve. It's ultimately supreme above all human teaching. And you've made his word void by your traditions, he said. Jesus said it. And that settles it. The Son of God said the Bible is not just historically reliable, it's divinely authoritative. So the final pillar of our faith is put in place. God exists. There is truth. We can know the true God exists. Miracles are possible. Bible is historically reliable. Jesus is the Son of God. He confirmed the Bible to be the Word of God. The Son of God promised the New Testament because only the Old Testament was written when he said that. But the Holy Spirit's coming, and he will teach you, disciples, all things, bring to remembrance all things. He'll guide you into all the truth he promised. Here it is in a nutshell. There is absolute truth. You can't deny it. Truth can be known. You can't deny it. It is true that a theistic God exists. Three good reasons for believing it. If God exists, miracles are possible. If the New Testament is historically reliable, and Jesus claimed to be God in the New Testament, and Jesus proved to be God by miracles, and Jesus claimed the Bible is the Word of God, therefore the Bible is the Word of God. Five pillars of our faith firmly founded in good reason and good evidence. There's no reason you have to go through life with a liver quiver religion. I got a blessing in my bosom. I know it's true. You can go through life to get back to our elevators. You don't have to close your eyes and step in the dark elevator where you can't see a floor. Open your eyes and look at the evidence. There's a floor. There's somebody coming out. You can step in. It's solid. Pillars of your faith are solid. Let's pray. Father, how grateful we are that these things were not done in a corner, as Paul said, that there are good reasons to believe, and that our faith is founded in facts, not in feeling. And as Martin Luther said, feelings come and feelings go, and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, not else is worth believing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.